Thank you. At that point, we conclude general questions this morning. Our next item of business is First Minister's questions. And at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. This week, John Swinney spoke about the process of sanctioning Michael Matheson. He said this, in no other walk of life would this be judged to be acceptable. So can I ask the First Minister, in what other walk of life would Michael Matheson still be in a job? First Minister. I think the issues in relation to the case of Michael Matheson have been well exercised within Parliament and Parliament came to its conclusions yesterday and I accept the conclusions that Parliament arrived at last night. Douglas Ross. Uh, I'm not surprised John Swinney wants to move on as quickly as possible and he accepts the judgments that Parliament came to last night. What the people of Scotland want to know is John Swinney's judgment because we haven't heard that yet. He refused to support any sanction at all for his friend Michael Matheson. That MSP has now been banned from Parliament for 27 days, but he's not been suspended from the SNP by John Swinney. People across Scotland think Michael Matheson should have been sacked because they would have been in the same circumstances. It's one rule for the SNP and another for everyone else in Scotland. Not only have the SNP refused to support any sanction for Michael Matheson, Incredibly, one of their SNP members of this parliament said yesterday, we actually need more MSPs like Michael Matheson. It's incredible, just like it's incredible that the First Minister is still defending his disgraced colleague. So given the First Minister refused to support the 27-day ban for Michael Matheson, what does John Swinney personally think would have been a suitable punishment for the disgraced former Health Secretary. First Minister. I, I fear that Douglas Ross hasn't been listening to my earlier answer because I said I accepted the decision that Parliament had arrived at yeah. last night. And, and the, reason, the reason why I did not so, uh, vote for it last night is because I felt the process was tainted for the reasons that I rehearsed last week at First Minister's questions. And yesterday, Parliament said, in relation to the points that I have raised, and Mr Ross voted for this, that the, that the, actions, the actions that led to the issues that caused me concern runs the risk of the committee report being open to bias and prejudice and the complaint being prejudged, thereby bringing the Parliament into disrepute. That is what I put to Parliament last week, and that's why I took the view that I could not support the sanction, because the process was Mr. tainted. Ross. And I, but I make clear for now the third time that I accept the decision made by Parliament yesterday. Douglas Ross. Th that's not clear, First Minister, because you've just said you don't support the sanction. Your words, I don't support the sanction. So tell us what you would support. What is the sanction that would be reasonable for John Swinney to accept against uh, Michael Matheson. Uh, and he's spoken about the Standards Committee and previously about his own correspondence to the chair of that committee. What John Swinney has not mentioned during all of these deliberations uh, is correspondence that he himself received from a constituent in his Perthshire constituency. It's included in the Parliament's report that we were discussing yesterday and I'm raising today. John Swinney's constituent said Michael Matheson's £11,000 expenses claim was the equivalent of five years of tax on their retirement income, four years of council tax payments, or three years of energy bills. And Michael Matheson, in the words of John Swinney's Perthshire constituent, said this. He removed that money from the public purse for his own personal gain in a false claim. Now, that was sent to John Swinney in November. His constituent was calling for Michael Matheson to resign then. But John Swinney ignored his constituent so he could protect his friend. So how can John Swinney keep his own integrity if he backs a man who has none? First Minister. Um, uh, I, for the fourth time, presiding officer, 
I accept the outcome of the decision that Parliament arrived at yesterday. And what that includes is an acknowledgement by Parliament that the process that was undertaken by the committee risks bringing the Parliament into disrepute. Now, Mr Ross cannot escape what he voted for last night. And what that, and what that means is that Parliament has got to consider how it exercises its responsibilities in accordance with the principles of natural justice, which I am glad that Parliament agreed last night that the parliamentary corporate body should initiate an independent review of the Parliament's complaint process to restore integrity and confidence in the Parliament and its procedures. And that's what Parliament's decided to do. And what I will do is I will engage directly with my constituents who have returned me to this Parliament on six occasions. Yeah. I will continue to engage with my constituents on a regular basis to serve them as faithfully as I have always done, and I will extend that to faithfully serving the country of which I have the privilege to be First Minister. Douglas Ross. John Swinney claimed he was a safe pair of hands. But even he must accept the shambles he has made of this scandal. But let's just listen to what John Swinney previously said when it was Henry McLeish who'd claimed expenses and then paid them back. John Swinney's words, if the SNP members would like to hear. People around Scotland will be staggered by the amount of money that is involved. Crucially, the bond of trust that must exist between Scotland's First Minister and the people has been broken. John Swinney finished by saying, for the good of the Scottish Parliament, Mr McLeish must resign. What, what happened to that John Swinney? Where's he gone? When it doesn't involve someone in the SNP, John Swinney tries to talk like a man of integrity. He demands resignations. He speaks of trust. He preaches about honesty. But now it's his SNP friend He's abandoned the principles he once had. So what does John Swinney's personal handling of this scandal say about his own character? First Minister. Can I remind Douglas Ross that in 2018, the Conservative group in this Parliament, and I appreciate Mr Ross was not a member of the group at that time, he'd left the, the Scottish Parliament by that time, the Conservative group in this Parliament voted against sanctions that were applied by the Standards Committee on one of Mr Ross's members. So Mr Ross has got absolutely no credibility whatsoever to come here, has no credibility whatsoever to come here and suggest that um, my conduct or my actions have been in we will any hear way the First Minister here. Now, in addition to that, the issues that I went through at length last week, presiding officer, in answering Mr Ross. The issues I raised have now been endorsed by Parliament. First Minister, Mr Ross, Mr Ross, you are aware that unless you've been called to speak, we should not be hearing any other member other than the member who's been called to speak. First Minister. So, Presiding Officer, the issues I raised have now been endorsed by Parliament. Mr Ross, I am going to ask you to apologise I apologise. I was simply saying they've not been Mr. answered. Ross, Mr Ross, if this occurs again, I will be extremely frustrated and disappointed. First Minister. So, Presiding Officer, the issues that I raised last week have now been endorsed by the Democratic National Parliament of Scotland, and there is a process now underway which the corporate body will lead which will address these issues and restore, in the words of the parliamentary motion, integrity and confidence in the Parliament and its procedures, which matter deeply to me as a member of this Parliament. For the fifth time, could I indicate that I accept the conclusions of Parliament yesterday? And the last thing I'm going to say to Mr Ross is this. I think it's pretty instructive that when Mr Ross goes through his sequence of questions and then eventually gets to the pouring out of the volume of personal abuse that he pours out, 
it tells us that Mr Ross has lost the argument, just as he has lost the argument throughout all of this, because he cannot do anything other than resort to nasty personal abuse. That's what Mr Ross contributes to this Parliament. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Officer, yesterday, this Parliament agreed to suspend former Health Secretary Michael Matheson for attempting to misuse £11,000 of public money. And rather than defending Scots and protecting the integrity of Parliament, John Swinney chose to put his party before the country. Had this been at Westminster, Michael Matheson would now be facing a recall petition and potentially a by-election. But yet again, the SNP holds Scotland to a lower standard and believe it's one rule for them and another rule for everyone else. And while John Swinney spent all of his time this week managing his party and defending sleaze, waiting lists in Scotland reached a record high. Now over 840,000 Scots are stuck on an NHS waiting list. More than one in 10 have been waiting more than a year. Why is John Swinney putting the SNP first, not Scotland? First Minister. Senator, so, I am the first to acknowledge that we face challenges in the National Health Service as a consequence, as these issues have been well rehearsed in Parliament, of the aftermath of COVID and the implications that's had on the amount of time that people are having to wait. And I'm, I'm sorry for the amount of time people are having to wait for treatment. We are reducing the longest waits and we are making headway in that. In relation to the volume of activity within the National Health Service, the statistics this week indicate an increase in the, uh, the, the level of activity within the National Health Service to begin to eat into those long waiting times, which I accept are far too long for too many people. But the steps that the government is taking through the investment of £30 million in the uh, waiting times programme, the establishment of the national treatment centres, which are already making an impact in this activity, and which uh, are producing some of that welcome level of increased activity, combined with the focus in the National Health Service on tackling the longest waits, are the measures the government is taking forward to ensure that we tackle the legitimate issue that Mr Sarwar raises with me. Anna Sarwar. President Officer, waiting lists are going up in Scotland, not down, and I think John Swinney has to get his head out of the sand. Because every day John Swinney spends putting the SNP before Scotland has consequences for our NHS. Consequences for patients like Natalie from Glasgow. In 2017, Natalie had emergency surgery for a brain tumour. In 2021, she began to feel symptoms and specifically pain around her eye. She has a tumour around her optical nerve, which is causing her pain and pushing on her eye socket. In December last year, she was told she would need surgery and part of her skull would need to be removed and not replaced. She has heard nothing since. A brain tumour, and she's heard nothing for almost six months. And she's been told she could uh, lose her sight if not treated. She told me this morning, that just makes the anxiety and the concerns worse. I'm worried about the pain being an indication that the tumour is getting worse, but I have no way of knowing. I'm in the dark and feel completely alone during all of this. So does the First Minister understand that patients like Natalie should be his priority, not defending a failed health secretary who attempted to misuse public money? First Minister. The first thing I would say, say is to say to Natalie, I understand it, it, entirely the anxiety that she faces, and I'm sorry that she's not heard anything since December. And if Mr Sawar, in the aftermath of today's exchanges, would like to advise me of the details, I will take the issue up uh, as he would understand I, I would do. Let me say also that I, um, patients like Natalie are my focus. I'm spending a huge amount of my time as First Minister focusing on the real and legitimate concerns of people in Scotland about our public services. I said to Parliament last week that my priorities would, uh, would address the challenges in our public services. It would be one of the four major themes, along with eradicating child poverty, the transition to net zero, and the stimulation of economic growth. 
those uh, reforms and developments and, and, and progression in our public services will be at the heart of my priorities, and they are. That's what the Cabinet was talking about in the course of our meeting this week, and we will continue to do that. So I assure Mr Sawa and I assure Natalie that the concerns of people in Scotland of getting access to healthcare treatment when they need it and at the earliest possible opportunity will be fundamental to the priorities I take forward on behalf of the people of Scotland. Anna Sarwar. Mr. Officer, we hear the same answer week after week, month after month, year after year, and things keep getting worse for people right across the country. And I've heard what the First Minister has said, but it doesn't change the fact that he has spent the past week fighting for Michael Matheson when he should have been fighting for patients like Natalie and hundreds of thousands of Scots like her. Yep. And after 17 years of this SNP government, one in six Scots are stuck on an NHS waiting list. Our NHS desperately needs change. In 1948, we created our NHS. In 1997, we rescued our NHS. And on July 5th, the 76th birthday of our NHS, we will begin the process of rescuing it again. But that also needs change in Scotland, because the priorities of this SNP government are all wrong. Let's Why Mr. is John Swinney more interested in defending Michael Matheson than defending our NHS? Why is John Swinney putting his party before the country? And why is John Swinney failing NHS staff and NHS patients every single day? First Minister. I, I reiterate that my primary concern is to make sure that people like Natalie receive the treatment they want at the earliest possible opportunity to address the anxiety and the acute health requirements that they have. And Again, if Mr Sawa would give me the details, I'll attend to that after First Minister's questions. But I have to say, some of the rest of what Mr Sawa then went on to is just a little bit hollow. Yeah. West Streeting, the Labour Shadow Health Secretary, said this on Wednesday morning. The NHS is in crisis in every part of the United Kingdom because the decisions that are taken in Westminster don't just affect England, but Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Earlier in the month, he had said, all roads do lead back to Westminster because of the austerity that we've suffered for 15 years, 14 years. Now, in relation to that austerity programme, Rachel Reeves, the Shadow Chancellor, has indicated that the Labour Party, if it's elected to office, will not increase income tax or national insurance or corporation tax or VAT. And that it's accepted very strict borrowing limits within very strict fiscal rules and very strict tax rules and squeeze spending budgets. What that amounts to is austerity on stilts yeah. from the Labour, any incoming <laughs> Labour government. And if that wasn't bad enough, Wes, Wes Streeting said yesterday that he will hold the door wide open for the private sector in the National Health Service. He will hold the door wide open. We will go, he went on to say, we will go further than New Labour ever did. I want the NHS to form partnerships with the private sector that goes beyond just hospitals. So don't give me the stuff about the anniversary of the National Health yeah. Service. Labour's preparing to sell us out on austerity yeah. and the National Health Service and can't be trusted to deliver for the people of Scotland. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. This week, the First Minister did give uh, clarity on one issue when he called on the UK government to recognise the state of Palestine and end arms sales to Israel. But the same clarity is needed on the Scottish government's devolved responsibilities in relation to Israel's genocidal action against Palestine. The United Nations has published a list of around 90 companies, which it considers complicit in the illegal settlements that Israel has been constructing on Palestinian territory in the West Bank. Now, back in November, my colleague Ross Greer asked the former First Minister to agree that these companies should be banned from receiving public grants and contracts here in Scotland from within the devolved government's responsibilities. 
the then First Minister agreed in principle, saying that no company profiting from occupation should profit here in Scotland too. It's seven months later, tens of thousands of deaths later, including at least 13,000 children. And in the West Bank, hundreds of Palestinians have been killed by Israeli soldiers and extremists. And yet the Scottish Government has not yet taken this action to ban companies on the UN's list of complicit companies from receiving grants. So will the First Minister send a very clear signal today, immediately banning these companies from receiving grants and other support from the Scottish Government? First Minister. I acknowledge the seriousness of the issues that Mr Harvey raises with me. And in what I said the other day, I indicated that there should be an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, that the hostages who have been taken should be returned to their loved ones, to whom they should have been returned a long time ago, and that arms sales to Israel should stop. Um, I also went on, as Mr Harvey has correctly said, to say that I believe the United Kingdom should recognise the state of Palestine as an independent state. It is long overdue, and it would be a contribution towards trying to stabilise the situation in the Middle East. So I hope Mr Harvey takes from that the, um, the, the direction of my thinking on this matter and my desire to do as much as I can to help resolve the situation from our position. Um, I will look carefully at the points that Mr Harvey has raised about any support for companies that are involved in this activity. Our enterprise agencies have appropriate safeguards in place to ensure that any funding provided is used only for the specific purpose for which it is intended. I suspect in Mr Harvey's question he wants me to extend that beyond that uh, protection and on that matter I would have to take great care to ensure we had a legal justification for so doing. But if Mr Harvey and Mr Greer would care to provide me with the material um, that, about which they are concerned, I will investigate that and determine if there is more that the government can, can do and I will of course update Parliament uh, uh, on the basis of those uh, investigations. Patrick Harvey. Uh, I strongly agree with every element of what the First Minister has said the UK Government should do, but he is not yet providing clarity on what the Scottish Government should do within its powers. I mentioned those companies on the list uh, the UN deems complicit in West Bank settlements, illegal Israeli settlements in the West Bank. And I think the First Minister may have been moving on to, ask, uh, to answer in relation to arms companies which are provided with grants and other forms of financial support by the Scottish Government. The First Minister is right that they do not support the production of munitions with those grants, but that simply isn't enough. If you contribute to building a bigger bomb factory, you don't get to say that you haven't funded the production of the bombs. And even since October the 7th, Raytheon, BAE Systems and Leonardo have all received eye-watering sums from the Scottish Government's agency, Scottish Enterprise. This is in a time when the I world is recoiling in Harvey. revulsion at the appalling attacks, including the most, uh, the most recent attacks against Palestinians sheltering in Rafah. It is shocking and inexplicable that at the same time Mr. as the Scottish Harvey, Government can is I have calling question, for an end please? to arms sales, they are directly funding these manufacturers. Will the First Minister change this policy immediately? First Minister. Well, I, I, I... I, I, I do take seriously the point that Mr Harvey puts to me. I, I, I would just say that I, 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 I don't think the analogy that he strikes about the construction of a, a weapons factory is a, a particularly fair analogy of the support that we put in place. But I will go away and, and look at that carefully. The point I was going on that I was essentially raising in my earlier answer is that there will be um, a legal basis for us applying safeguards in relation to the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the issuing of grants. But we have to have a legal basis for saying why on other issues not related to the Israel-Gaza conflict that we would have a basis for not providing a grant. And, that is, and that's not me being pedantic. That's just simply the legal basis upon which the government has got to act. And we have to always act within the law. I have to take the views of, my, of the law officers uh, deadly seriously in the actions that we take. But if Mr Harvey would care to uh, 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 correspond with me in more detail about this, 
I will happily explore the issues that he raises, which I recognise are important and sensitive to people in our country. Question number four, Claire Hawley. Thank you, President Officer, and I refer members to my register of interest. I hold a bank nurse contract with Greater Glasgow and Clyde NHS. To ask the First Minister what assessment the Scottish Government has made of the potential impact on the health service in Scotland of Home Office data showing that the health and care worker visa applications are 76 per cent lower in January to April this year compared to last year. First Minister. Officer, workers from overseas are filling vital roles supporting people who rely on them for the care they provide. This Government values people who have chosen to come to Scotland to make a positive contribution to our public services. Stopping people from bringing dependents to the UK is short-sighted and risks exacerbating shortages in the care sector. It is wrong that these changes have been driven by arbitrary decisions to reduce numbers rather than the needs of our public services and communities. It is therefore very concerning that the number of health and care worker visa applications has fallen, as Claire Hawkey has recounted. Claire Hawkey. I thank the First Minister for that answer. The impact which the UK Government's cruel immigration policies are having on Scotland's health and social care sector is a substantial concern. Can the First Minister confirm that the SNP, both in Holyrood and in Westminster, will ensure Scotland remains a welcoming and fair country for health and care staff to live and work, particularly from overseas? First Minister. Uh, President Officer, I can give Claire Hawkey that assurance. Um, I think there are some very significant issues highlighted by the question that Claire Hawkey puts to me. Uh, Mr Sabar has raised an issue about NHS waiting times completely legitimately with me today. And one of the challenges that we face in the health service is the congestion in our hospitals created by delayed discharge. One of the issues about delayed discharge is that we do not have enough people able to deliver care packages within our communities. And as Claire Hawkey has indicated in her question, some of the supply of those workers is being eroded by the decisions that have been taken on immigration by the United Kingdom government. So there's a very direct effect on our ability to deliver sustainable health services because we quite simply do not have an available uh, workforce to enable that to be the case. And we do, as members will be familiar, have a very low level of unemployment within Scotland today. So the issue that Claire Hawkey raises may be about immigration, but has a direct effect on the delivery of public services in Scotland. And I assure Claire Hawkey and Parliament the Government will do all that we can to try to address this issue to ensure that we have adequate supplies of people to deliver social care and other health care activities in our country. Question number five, Russell Finlay. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports of a national crime agency warning about synthetic opioids being linked to rising numbers of deaths. First Minister. President, officer, the Scottish Government is working closely with Public Health Scotland as we are very concerned about the growing threat posed by synthetic opioids and in particular the increased appearance of nitazines in the drug supply. Public Health Scotland have been issuing alerts via radar, that's the Rapid Action Drug Alerts and Response, to healthcare staff and the public to highlight the increased dangers associated with nitazines. That alert was last updated in March 2024. The Scottish Drugs Forum launched a public campaign in December 2023 to spread awareness and to reduce risk. We are working with third sector delivery partners and with directors of public health to ensure that health boards are prepared at a local level. We are meeting regularly with the United Kingdom Government and other devolved governments to ensure that we are aligned in our activities with them. So Finlay. Thank you. There have been almost 50 known deaths in Scotland linked to synthetic opioids, and it's inevitable that more will die. Just last week, there was a mass overdose in Paisley. The terrifying potency of these man-made narcotics cannot be overstated. The death and devastation that they cause nails the lazy lie that there is any safe way to consume them. So does the First Minister agree that it is entirely right that they remain categorised as Class A substances under the Misuse of Drugs Act? First Minister. I think th I, I have quite a bit of sympathy with the depth of concern that um, Mr uh, Finlay raises and, and expresses to Parliament because the, um, the, the potency 
and the devastating impact of synthetic opioids is, I think, difficult to fathom. It is of such a different scale on this matter. So Mr Finlay is absolutely correct to sound the warnings that he is sounding. And that is why Public Health Scotland and in association with RADAR are communicating that message. Mr Finlay will obviously appreciate that there is a combination of activity that is necessary to tackle this threat. And it's a combination of three elements. It's about awareness raising, which Mr Finlay has uh, contributed to in his exchange, raising this issue with me at First Minister's question. There is the necessity to ensure we have the effective policing response in place to counter the supply of synthetic opioids. And there is the whole process of harm reduction that the government is engaged with. And so I give Mr Finlay the assurance that on those three grounds, the government is deeply engaged in this activity to address what I recognise is a very significant threat. Thank you. Question number six, Pam Duncan Clancy. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on whether teacher numbers should be maintained in light of the reported concern of many parents, pupils, and school staff in Glasgow. First Minister. Presiding Officer, we remain fully committed to protecting teacher numbers and are offering local authorities £145.5 million in this year's budget for that purpose. This funding will allow councils to protect teacher numbers in order to support children's education. And I would hope this is a goal that our local government partners would share. This government remains determined to close the poverty-related attainment gap and to reducing teacher workload. I do not believe these aims will be achieved by councils employing fewer teachers in our schools. We are currently in discussion with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities and wish to work with our local authority partners to deliver our shared commitments on education. Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the First Minister for that answer, but I'm afraid it will be cold comfort for teachers, parents and pupils in Glasgow, because the reality is that his SNP Green colleagues are slashing teacher numbers, impacting the purest and most disadvantaged pupils the most. And it's not the first time this has happened on this First Minister's watch. As one young person said the most at the most recent rally against these cuts, the First Minister owes it to young people to intervene after his decision in the 2020 exams fiasco saw the poorest pupils being downgraded. Presiding officer, today the First Minister talks about Parliament endorsements and on the 15th of May this Parliament sided with teachers, parents and pupils and endorsed calls on this government to intervene and protect job losses. So can I ask the First Minister what exactly is his government doing to deliver the will of this Parliament and when will the jobs be saved? First Minister. Obviously, these are matters for local authorities individually to take forward. That's the constitutional arrangements of this country, which, uh, which ensure that the delivery of education is a matter within the competence of local authorities. The government is... Pam Duncan Glancy asked me, what is the, what's the government doing to, to help with this? Well, what the government is doing to help with this is the government is offering £145.5 million to local authorities to protect teacher numbers, and that's what the government is doing. Now, I find, I have to say, Pam Duncan Glancy's concerns about this rather difficult to um, accept today, because if the Labour Party had had their budget proposals accepted in the city of Glasgow, then these, the, the proposals of £30 million in education cuts from the Labour Group on Glasgow City Council could have meant the loss of up to 650 teachers. So here we have the Labour Party coming here and on, in, in, in their proposition to people in this election, the prolonging of austerity, which is what they're going to carry on, so there'll be no new money coming along the track, prolonged austerity, continuing where the Tories have left off, and then when they're in council chambers around the country, they're wanting to reduce teacher numbers by 650. That is just unacceptable. The Scottish Government is doing what we can to support local authorities to protect teacher numbers, and we'll engage with local authorities to enable that's the case. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In 2021, the SNP promised not merely to maintain teacher numbers, but to deliver an additional 3,500 teachers and classroom assistants. However, the latest data shows there are 250 fewer teachers than there were when that promise was made. So could the First Minister confirm that, like the laptops, the bikes, the free meals, this is another broken promise, isn't it? First Minister. You know, when they were giving out brass necks, they gave them out in abundance over here. 
since, since, since 2021, since 2021, Members. since 2021, there has been there have been two significant factors that have undermined the public finances in the United Kingdom. The first has been the uh, rampant inflation that has eroded the value of public sector budgets. So although inflation is lower today than it was a year ago, prices are still very much higher because of the effect of ten, over 10% double-digit inflation, the first we've had for over 40 years in the United Kingdom. And the second thing that's happened is that the cost of, 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 of investing, the cost of supporting our public services has gone through the roof because of the mistakes made by Liz Truss and Quasi Quartine in that ridiculous uh, uh, statement that was made to the House of Commons. So I, 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 have to say to, I have to say to Liam Kerr that it is just preposterous for the Conservatives to come here and demand me to do more, to spend more money, when the consequence of their management of the United Economy has been so damaging to Scotland's interests. We move to constituency and general supplementaries, and I call David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. The SNP Scottish Government continued investment in our rail services is very welcome, bringing ScotRail into public ownership, taking action to drive down ticket prices and investing in new infrastructure. Most recently, the Leave Mouth Rail Link, rail link will be a transformation for an area of many of my constituents, improving access to leisure, economic employment and educational opportunities. Does the First Minister agree that the next UK Government has follow the Scottish Government's lead and start properly investment in the UK rail network by returning services to public hand. First Minister. Uh, President Officer, I was delighted yesterday to have the opportunity with Mr Torrance and with my colleague Jenny Goruth, um, local members, uh, to, and the, the Transport Secretary to be present at the opening of the Leavenmouth Rail Link. Um, it's a, a wonderful project which has come about because of tenacious campaigning by the Leavenmouth Rail Link Committee, who have um, garnered support on a cross-party basis for a new rail link. It will connect uh, the communities around uh, Leaven to the rail network, opening up educational, social and economic opportunities for that community, and also opening up that community as a place to visit and as a destination on the rail network. So I think it's a superb investment. I congratulate everyone involved in the Leavenmouth Rail Link, and I would certainly want to see the investment resources being available to ensure that we could undertake other projects of that character around the country, but that will only come if there is a stimulation to capital investment, yeah. which is absolutely desperately required after 14 years of austerity. Absolutely. Sue Webber. First Minister, on Friday the 1st of December 2023 at 10.25pm, an explosion ripped through homes in Baberton Mains Avenue, tragically resulting in the loss of one life. Some six months on, families living on the avenue and neighbouring streets relive the horror of that night every day upon going about their everyday lives. Families whose homes were destroyed are none the wiser regarding the future of their homes. No visible or perceivable progress has been made. The site looks much the same as it did on that bleak morning on the 2nd of December. Last week, one resident drew a parallel between the council and insurance companies as a Mexican standoff. First Minister, will you meet with me and the families and do all you can to influence this stalemate and move things on for those that are left in limbo? First Minister. I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm very happy to agree to that. I, I, I remember I, I was born and brought up in Edinburgh, not far from Barberton, so I, I know the area very well. I, I, I saw those scenes with absolute horror, so I, I totally, well, I can observe from afar the horror that people have suffered. Um, I'll happily meet with um, Sue Webber and her constituents on this matter. Um, the, 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 the question that may be lurking in amongst there is where statutory investigations are about the, uh, the, 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 the incident that happened, which may be contributing to delays, but uh, I'm probably saying more at this stage than I probably should say without uh, delving into the detail. But I'll look closely and very, be very happy to meet on that question. Daniel Johnson. Uh, yesterday, Reform Scotland published its Computing the Future report into the state of computer science teachers. It found that one in eight schools are without a dedicated computer science teacher, denying 32,000 pupils access to that resource. It found a 25% drop 
in computer science teachers over 15 years, representing a denial of opportunity to young people and a break on growth in this critical sector. Four years on from the Stir review, Mark Logan, its author, stated to the Education Committee yesterday that trying to drive reform in the system, especially with Education Scotland, had been like, and I quote, dragging a heavily sedated bull elephant backwards through cold treacle. And to the report, he said that it all adds up to a bad static picture, and uh, to me, it sounds like a crisis. Does the First Minister agree with the Scottish Government's Chief Entrepreneur? First Minister. Uh, well, I, I, I take very seriously what the Chief Entrepreneur says, and, and I understand Mark Logan has been working on uh, the implementation of these recommendations and to trying to make progress. Um, if, uh, if, if Mark Logan needs a bit more assistance from the First Minister, I will certainly offer it, and, and, and I know the Deputy First Minister will be very keen to support him in his efforts, because accessing computer science education for pupils is vital as an investment in the future of Scotland, and there is work that is being delivered to, um, to establish new courses, um, if my memory says me right, with the University of Aberdeen to take forward these um, these priorities, um, but I'm very happy, and Deputy First Minister will do so, to engage with Mark Logan on that important question. Michelle Thompson. Thanks to Westminster economic mismanagement, business across Scotland, including in my constituency of Falkirk East, are facing pressures, costs, extra money, red tape, costs due to Brexit. What assessment has the Scottish Government been able to make of the impact of the UK Government new post-Brexit border checks on business in Scotland, checks which are costly, unnecessary and supported by Tories and Labour alike. First Minister. Yeah. So, so the, the implications of Brexit, uh, we, we've touched on some of them already today in response to the, the, to the question from Claire Hockey about the availability of people. But Michelle Thompson is absolutely correct that uh, I cannot speak to a business in the country that is not suffering from the effects of Brexit, whether that's about the availability of staff or it's about access, uh, the cost of doing business or the loss of opportunity, because it just is so much more difficult to actually advance some of these questions. So I, um, the, 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 the information that I have most recently is the National Audit Office uh, undertook a report which estimated that UK traders were facing additional costs of £469 million per year. Uh, that's on top of costs of £7.5 billion annually since 2019 for completing customs declarations on the UK to EU trade. So I think that's a scale of the competitive disadvantage that's been inflicted by the folly of Brexit, which unfortunately is supported by both the Conservative and Labour parties, and which the SNP would want to address by establishing Scotland's independent membership of the European Union. Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presenting Officer. First Minister, uh, last weekend in Oregon, Josh Kerr from Edinburgh AC smashed the British mile record in an astonishing 3 minutes 45, eclipsing the great Steve Cram's record, of, of, uh, which he's held for 39 years. He now ranks sixth on the world all-time list. He is already the world 1,500-metre champion. He is already the world indoor 3,000-metre champion and holds an Olympic bronze medal. Behind him, from Griff McNaught, Neil Gourley running an astonishing 3 minutes 47, and Jake Whiteman from Edinburgh AC, a former 1500 metre world champion, running 3 minutes 47. Would the First Minister agree with me that these athletes, along with their female counterparts like Laura Muir, and Gemma Ricci, Elise McColgan, and Erin Wallace, are an inspiration to the future uh, sportsmen and women? And would he join with me wishing them well in the upcoming Olympics in Paris? First Minister. I, I, I'm absolutely delighted to do so and to pay tribute to the astonishing achievements of all of the individuals that Mr Whittle mentioned there, because they are, uh, they are utterly and totally inspiring. Um, I have to say to Mr Whittle, um, they will be a great deal faster than both he and I, if I may say so, and they are certainly a great deal faster than I was running through the, sitter, the centre of Edinburgh this morning at the ungodly hour that I was running this morning. But I do pay warm tribute, and they are an, an encouragement to us all to exercise, perhaps not as fast as they are able to exercise and compete, but to exercise and to take due care of ourselves to ensure our own physical fitness. So I, I'm very happy to associate myself with the comments of, uh, of Brian Whittle and to encourage all of the athletes in the competitions they have in the forthcoming competitions. 
Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. If the First Minister agrees that there is indeed a climate emergency, why is the government's biggest capital project in Glasgow rebuilding a 50-year-old motorway viaduct now estimated at a staggering cost of over £150 million and with no consultation with my constituents while cutting the city's public transport budget to zero? Yeah. First Minister. Uh, President Officer, there will be um, essential projects that have got to be undertaken to, uh, to ensure public safety and also to guarantee that we have the appropriate level of connectivity within our communities. Now, there are, obviously, there are, um, there is a debate to be had about in the merits of individual projects, but the government has got an obligation to work with local authorities in a spirit of partnership to uh, agree the infrastructure improvements that are necessary to assure connectivity in our country. And Stuart McMillan. Thank you. Senator also, can the First Minister clarify if the guidance from the Permanent Secretary concerning the UK election on the 4th of July will result in the delaying of the Small Vessel Replacement Programme being announced? First Minister. President Officer, I, uh, I answered a question on Tuesday which included the guidance that has been given to me by the Permanent Secretary, which regrettably, from my perspective, means that uh, a significant amount of the explanation of the government's programme will have to wait until after the United Kingdom election has, um, has been con uh, concluded. Um, we do not anticipate an announcement on the small vessel replacement programme before the end of the pre-election period, as consideration of the business case by ministers remains ongoing. But if there is um, any um, uh, alteration to that particular view, I will share that with Parliament. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business is a member's business debate in the name of Alec Rowley, and there will now be a short suspension to allow those leaving the chamber and public gallery to do so.